American-made Atlas traps are made right here in Kansas and feature the finest quality, innovation, and support in the business. Atlas traps are made using aircraft quality aluminum and stainless steel to ensure your traps will outlast the competition. So whether you're an individual needing a private trap for practice and recreation, or a club needing to outfit your entire facility, family-owned and operated Atlas traps can suit all your needs. Visit atlastraps.com to see the full line of commercial and recreational traps and accessories. With prices that won't make you see red and quality that won't leave you feeling blue, Atlas has the finest equipment available. This episode is sponsored by quality and innovative Game Boar cartridges. Game Boar shot shells are the choice of world champion David Radulovich and 26 times world champion George Digweed MBE. White Gold and Dark Storm contain precision-made diamond shot, manufactured exclusively in England, and coupled with high-performance smooth velocities, providing less felt recoil. If you're serious about your scores, you have to shoot with the best. When every clay counts, make sure you never compromise. Game Boar is the most decorated feet task and sporting clay shot shells in the sports history. Available now throughout the U.S., exclusively from KL Ammo. Find them online at www.gameboarus.com. Game Boar are simply the champion's choice. Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast with your hosts, Jason Rambo and Sean Alley. We bring you all things sporting clays. Our focus is bringing new shooters to the sport and helping all shooters by giving you the most useful info from coaches, pro shooters, gun clubs, product and service specialists. The Dead Pair Podcast. What every shotgun shooter wants to hear. Paul? Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dead Pair Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Rambo, with the man that's large and in charge, Mr. Alley. I'm glad you're finally getting that right. <laughs> yeah. Hey everyone, this is part two of two with David Radulovich and Anthony Matarese. Um, Sorry it went so long, but we didn't want to edit this. We didn't want to cut it down. There's a lot of great information we're going to get right back to the interview. Um, everyone, please listen in and <laughs> pay attention. Yeah, these guys definitely spew out a lot of information and just was way too much to put into one episode. Otherwise, it would have been over two hours long. Yeah, for sure. So enjoy, listen in, and we'll see you at the end. So, Well, and this wasn't on our list of questions, but it just, it, it, it's eating me up. Um Real quick, I, I had a conversation with Mike Luongo on our last podcast about post-shot routine, and I'm starting to find, and I'm nowhere near as advanced as you guys are, but I'm starting to find more and more value in the post-shot as much as the pre-shot routine. Do you guys also put as much emphasis on your post-shot as your pre-shot? That's a good question. Um for me, I don't really think that I have too much of a post shot routine, even at all. Um, I kind of I'll explain it by this: when I'm running through a course, if I'm shooting really good, um, it's a it's a kind of like a chess match in my head. All of my work, I, I call it my research. I have three phases, research, planning, and execution. Okay, so the research phase, the, the first two phases, research and planning happen outside the box. Execution, the most simple of them, happens in the box. In the research phase, I'm outside the box looking around, figuring everything else, uh, f figuring everything out about the birds, the presentation, the probabilities of different approaches, um, that I can, right. And I'm using all the knowledge that I have about my mechanics, about my abilities, about my abilities that day. How good are my eyes? How relaxed am I? How much physical motor control do I have? How much finesse do I have? Do I have a lot of anxiety, which is causing quick movements in my hands? Um, do I have a lot of energy? Uh, there's so many variables involved. So I'm, I'm bouncing all of the approaches that I have to that presentation 
off of my, my self-awareness and analysis of what I have to work with that day. When I, that's my research phase. Once I, once I do that, basically I've found a way that I know, right, statistically that this is the best possible way for me right now to shoot this pair. That's my planning phase. So after I get to that point, I'm not going to step into the box until I have an answer for that phase two. Okay. If I step into the box, into the execution phase, I'm not really, I don't have a plan to execute. So therefore, you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be good. Honestly, a lot of times if I'm not, if I, if I'm not on the podium at a tournament, it's probably because I wasn't putting as much of an emphasis in those first two phases as possible. Cause honestly, it's a huge amount of work. Um, and I mean, it's like, it's actually exhausting to do, to do that. Um, consciously throughout around and it's so much work sometimes i don't even feel like doing it it's more fun for me not to do it and probably not win but <laughs> if i'm gonna literally it's dead serious um and uh the so if i'm doing that right okay and i get into the box and and i know that with all with my game that i came to that station right there that day um that this is the best possible plan that i can have there's no other exception to that rule i've already tested it out all the other options i've felt them out i know where the weaknesses are and i'm picking the one with the least amount of possible problems i'm not going to change that plan if i'm if i do change the plan in the execution phase it's because my research and planning wasn't good enough okay so if i'm in the execution phase and i know my plan after i shoot the pair if it didn't go well, my post shot is just this. Did I follow the plan? If the answer is no, then my next part is, okay, well, you idiot. Then just follow the plan for the next pair because you know it was supposed to work. If I, didn't, if I did follow the plan and it resulted in a miss, which is honestly very rare, um, then – because things like pressure slip in and you do something you, you hadn't planned or you looked where you didn't want to, or you just got careful and, you know, like, I mean, the plan involves all those things. If you do everything right and, and still miss, honestly, sometimes that's just an, a myth. It's supposed to, you know, you're not supposed to run every, every station. Sometimes well, maybe that five out of six is a par for me there, yeah. but that's, that's essentially what my, post shot is it's very simple but that's because all my stuff leading up to it is more complex well i i guess that might have been a little bit of a dumb question for you guys because um, no not at all that's a good question well i, I guess I'm, what i mean by that is for somebody like me that at my experience or let me let me rephrase that my inexperience level only being an a-class shooter i miss a lot more targets than you guys do so my mm -hmm. post shot seems to be a little bit more important to analyze the miss and what I did wrong so I can self-correct, put that back in. When I, as soon as I let go of those shells into the bucket, my post shot's done. And when I go back into my pre-shot, I'm compensating for that miss. Does that make sense to you what I'm saying, Anthony? Yeah, so I'll answer the question. I think uh, hit them the question that you're trying to answer. So, uh, I'm similar to Dave for my shooting. So if, if I hit the bird, the only thing I potentially ask myself is if I, is I can, if I don't remember, if I didn't see it well, like I didn't, I didn't execute visually as well as I could. If my technical part was sloppy, but my initial planning was good and I hit the clay, I definitely don't evaluate that or do anything post shot because I'm just going to get sucked into my conscious mind when I'm already have a dead target. Yeah. So I, I don't, you know, I think, you know, Wendell had a podcast where he talked a lot about post shot. Okay. And some of the things I respect Wendell greatly as a competitor, some of the things he talked about in post shot, you know, like preventing a miss from coming. Well, I don't do that. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's completely, you know, if I hit the son of a bitch, I'm glad. Okay. <laughs> you know? so, so yeah, I just want to 
get to the next one without thinking about anything except looking at the target. So unless it's visual, you know, if I made a shitty move and hit it, I don't care. Okay. Um, because that wasn't my plan to make a bad move anyway. It just happened. So I'm going to fix a visual component. That's about it. Um, if the bird beat me and my whole point was what I thought it was and I might not even change it. I'll just let it beat me the next three times, right? <laughs> because, because it worked. Right. So my conscious mind is more detrimental than it, sometimes than a, than a, than correct technique and theory, you know, theory is theory, it, you know, results are results. If I miss and I thought the bird should have broke. Okay. Then we have some kind of a post shot. And right. I think that's kind of maybe closer to your question. Like, you missed the first crosser. You thought that was a good plan. You thought you saw the clay. Well, geez, you know, what should I do now? So that's a post shot that is probably important for a lot of less experienced shooters, people that are missing more birds than Dave and I, if Dave misses four birds, how many does he got to worry about in a post shot? (laughs) True. Four, four, you know, if, if you shoot a 68, okay. You know, you know, you're worried about 30, right? So you got more to, to figure out what to do next, particularly wherever you miss them in the sequence. Okay. Um, and any ones that you miss on the first or the second pair, obviously important. If you hit the first pair, the, probably the only thing, and then you miss after that, the, probably the only thing that you need to worry about in a post shot is how good was your vision and your trust. Okay. Right. Because your your plan was good and your read was good. So if you go dead pair, dead lost, dead lost, then you got two scenarios. One is you got careful and you and or careless and your visual discipline on the next two pairs was not any good. Or two, your plan was okay, your read was okay you have enough inconsistency in your technique that you hit the first bird with the pattern. Okay. Cause you're shooting a shotgun and you got, IC in there and that's why you cracked the first one in three pieces, but you really weren't. And your, your technique really wasn't, wasn't good enough to hit it three times in a row. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes people, why do I hit five out of six on that? Well, you did everything pretty good, but your moves not great. So <laughs> your skill sets five out of six, you hit five out of six. Cause that's where your skill set is. Okay. <laughs> you know, you know, the reason you, the reason why didn't I get six? Well, you could have got four out of six, okay, but you got five out of six, so you better be grateful. Um, you know. <laughs> sound similar or sound familiar, Jason? Uh, so yeah. Sometimes <laughs> that's the truth, though. You know, the person's yeah. approach and their mechanics aren't that good. So that means the read was good, their plan is good, and they're consistently with how they get the gun in the right get the gun at the right address is is thirty three percent. Okay, yeah. you know, so that's the, that's just the reality. You need to practice that more. If you miss the first, if you go dead lost and you missed on the first pair completely, okay, on that bird, you can still ask yourself if you saw the clay clay well and you executed correct visually. However, if your answer is yes and you're surprised that it didn't break, now you might have to make a change in your in your actual plan. Okay, like I plan to insert the gun a little ahead of the bird. However, you get to that point, which is a whole another topic of, you know, how you decide, you know, do I give it no lead, some lead, big lead, you know, you get some type of a, you know, we can say that, well, we don't worry about lead, but if you got a straightaway, I, you, you probably shoot at it and you have a crosser, you probably shoot in front of it. And if it's crossing further, you shoot further in front of it. And if you didn't account for that at all, then that's, that's part of the problem. And if you accounted for that incorrectly by some factor, that could be the that could be the problem as well. That becomes difficult. At best, it's just for for myself included at times, it's just an educated guess. So unfortunately, an educated guess is is based off of you know with with experience you get better judgment, right? Mm-hmm. Right. But you need but you need prior bad judgment to get experience. So. <laughs> You know, you, you're going to, it's going to be a little bit of a, little bit of a hard road at times. So you have to know a little bit about what your tendency is. You know, if you have a 40 yard crosser and historically on the first pair and you missed it, you shot behind, then you're probably behind. Okay. Right. <laughs> but, 
but but not always okay <laughs> you know so, <laughs> you know so there there's no simple answer to your question no. so i guess i guess the answer is if it's on the first pair it's different than if it's on the second pair if you go dead lost dead pair dead lost you know then you start looking at is my technique solid was I close but just didn't execute well? Was my vision good? Did I misread the bird if it's on the first pair? So there's a lot of ways we can go with it. Um, if you're hitting the birds, worry about if you saw the birds well and you trusted yourself. And I wouldn't worry about a lot a lot other than that. If you feel like your moves weren't that good, then write it down and go practice it. But, you know, when you got three pairs, it's not the time to practice. You know? uh, right. <laughs> it's, time, it's time to hit them. So right. it's, it's the first pair. Sometimes I see people hit the first pair and they, you know, oh, I got the back of that. Well, you got it. Okay. So why don't you just look at the bird and hit the next one instead of talk about where you hit it. <laughs> yeah. Because, because yeah. when you hit the back of the bird, it doesn't mean you're behind it. Okay. Right. If, you, if you ever shot a shotgun on a board, okay, there's pellets everywhere. So you could hit the back of the bird by being over it. Okay. Right. <laughs> <You know>? Right. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, you know, I have people hit the back of the bird and they go, was I on the back of it? I'm not standing there. I stand out here every day of my goddamn life. It looked like you were on it to me. I'm looking right over your shoulder. Okay. <laughs> and, and it, it broke. I, I don't think you were behind it. I think you weren't in the middle of it. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of that post analysis that's way out inaccurate as well. Um, so I think we're starting to ease into the debate questions more and more here. Um, opinions on ammo are about as plentiful as empty halls around a sporting course. However, I think both of you have undoubtedly unarguably earned the right to be somewhat of an authority on the subject, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to talk about brands. Okay. Mm hmm but can you guys tell us what you recommend to a student concerning loads and why? And David, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Uh, that's a thing that I wish more people would believe me when I tell them, which is that you don't need to go with pterodactyl loads from the start. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, that, I gotta tell you this story i had a really unique situation that i don't get very often but i have these two students that live about 30 minutes from me and it's husband and wife super nice amazing people the first time they both ever shot a shotgun ever shot a gun actually was with me in a lesson and they uh they both came with 28 gauge shotguns. They're both Kriegoff K. I think there was, a, it doesn't matter, whatever. They were over and over and under 28 gauges. And they said, now it's not un, it's not uncommon for someone like Anthony and I to get, you know, people who have never shot a gun before in a lesson. But what is somewhat uncommon is for people to come to us in the lesson that have never shot a gun before and say, I want to work as hard as I need to work in this game. And I want to do everything by the book, whatever you say I'm going to do. So I was like, dang, this is a cool opportunity. So I had this conversation with these two people and I was like, look, I've never done this before, but I kind of want to experiment with you guys. And I'm going to be completely upfront with you. And I'm going to tell you what I want to do and what I think it could lead to also both good and bad, but then also tell you the other way we can do it, which is the standard way, which would, will lead to very expectable results. Dave, uh, real quick, let me interrupt you. Yeah, sure. This question is about ammo. Yeah, I know I am. <laughs> okay. I'm talking about, <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> wait, we're on a podcast. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> yeah. It's all good, man. Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> the, uh, so anyways, one of the things that they asked me was, do you, should we go to a 12 gauge? And I was like, you know what? Honestly, I'd really like you to shoot these, you know, 28 gauges. Number one, they have no recoil. Number two, they're super light guns. So you're going to learn to move instead of learn to control a gun. And so we did that for a little while and we're just switching over to 12 gauge. And 
there's a huge I, I've never seen this before because I've never had the opportunity to do it before. But when I talk about fluidity of of like movement and lack of tension at the shot, it's it's amazing to watch. When you watch people that grew up shooting ounce and a quarter or ounce and an eighth, um and it just ball buster loads. I mean, it influences movement. I mean, it absolutely influences movement at the shot, which is the, if you were to say, what's the most important part of the shot and say, okay, well, the time that you pull the trigger. Yeah. Well, what happens if your whole body's seizing up at that time? Well, it's probably not a good thing, but as far as ammo goes, I mean, I want the lowest recoiling. I mean, if you start out with, I mean, if you're starting out, start out with seven eights, Go to. I mean, I shoot a one ounce load on everything. I don't know, Anthony. What do you shoot? I shoot uh, one ounce, twelve hundred and ninety feet a second. Yeah, so I shoot a one ounce, thirteen hundred. One ounce, thirteen hundred, and I shoot seven and a half on everything. And I, I personally believe that if you, you know, I want a low recoiling shell. I want. I don't want to vary in shot size. I want to always shoot the same thing. Um, and I, and I, you know, I practice with what I compete with, obviously that's a financial ability. That's a little easier for me. Um, but the, you know, I'd say bigger, the better shot, softer recoil, the better. And I mean, to me, that's about the most important things. I don't want to influence the movement of the gun. I don't want to cause any problems visually or physically at the shot. And as long as you have something that's patterning good in your gun and that you trust, then that's good. Well, Anthony, I know you've changed recently, so I'm I'm kind of anxious to hear your question or your answer. Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, I shot ounce and an eighth for years. I shot ounce and an eighth. Uh, shot an auto for years, so ounce and an eighth and an auto is basically no issue at all for me. Right. And uh, shot ounce and an eighth in my over and under for a while, probably five six years. And then I just switched two years ago to one ounce just because I could feel recoil catching up with me a little bit. I've been doing this a long time and uh, I'm not getting any younger. Just a lot of shells over a lot of years. I could feel it in my neck or my elbows and stuff after like if I did a bunch of practice for before a big tournament. Sometimes by the time the tournament got there, I felt like I was beat up. You know, I just figured I'm going to give one ounce a try. Corey Cruz, a friend of mine, he was shooting one ounce for a year or two two or three years before me, you know, he was, he was confident in the shot and he was confident that he actually could finish his shots better. You know, when he pulled the triggers, stay yeah. looking at the bird and not afraid of the gun. You never realize you're afraid of the gun until you shoot something less. Okay. You know, so you, it's one of those things where I would have never told you that I felt like when I pulled the trigger, there was any issue of recoil historically, but once I shot something with less recoil, I can feel the difference. What I tell students is shoot whatever you feel comfortable with and you can handle. I generally tell somebody something from 1200 feet to 1300, somewhere in that range is what I suggest 12 to 1300. I don't think you need any more than one ounce, but if you, if you want to shoot ounce and an eighth and you feel like you can handle it, use it. If you feel like you're beat up at all, you know, you're probably making a mistake. So that's generally my recommendation. Seven and a halves or eights. I don't think there's much difference. I mean, the, if you can psychologically change, okay, which is not easy, you know, there's probably some advantage there. I shoot all seven and a halves when I shoot feet this, uh, just because I don't want to have to, you know, shoot a close bird, you know, put a seven and a half in on a second barrel. Cause I wouldn't want to consider that I was going to miss it on the first barrel when it's closer with an eight. Uh, <laughs> that's basically the reason, you know, it's just, I don't want any doubt. So to shoot seven and a half. So if I have to shoot a seven and a half on a longer shot, I got seven and a half in both barrels. When I shoot sporting, I shoot almost all eights. Uh, I I'll shoot a, I'll carry seven and a half for a long rabbit or something like that, but I shoot almost all eights. But a lot of the birds that we see are, you know, closer than you do in PTAS on average, you know. Right. So I ha I will practice with all seven and a halves and I'll practice with all eights. And I can tell you with certainty that there's no difference. Gotcha. Okay. Unless you're past 50 yards, you know, on like all your shots. But you're not past your 50 yards ever on all your shots, you know. So 
I could take box of eights and shoot them on a station and a box of seven halves and shoot them on a station. If it's showing you anything type of the bird, I, I don't think I can tell the difference in the hits and, or misses in practice. I mean, I'll, I'll switch them up and put both in my pocket at the same time just to see, just so that I don't have any psychological difference between the two. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter uh, if the gun's in the right spot, you know? Yeah. Well, I can tell you from experience, like we've got two guys that we shoot with regularly and I can mention their names. They're probably going to hate me. So on one end of the spectrum, we've got our friend JD. He shoots ounce and an eighth because he can't shoot ounce and a quarter. And he'll tell you that. Okay. He'd shoot three and a half inch mags if he could. Right. Right. And then on the other side of the, of the spectrum, we've got Eric who he would almost rather shoot his 28 gauge than his 12 gauge, <laughs> you know? So, and, and they're different guys they're different mentalities, but I also believe that it probably has a lot to do with the attitude of the shooter. Right. I mean, what they like, what they feel comfortable with, um, you, you know, not so much even in the, in the shell department, the load, it's just whatever they feel most confident in. And they both shoot well. I mean, they both shoot well with what they shoot. It's just the mindset, I guess, sometimes comes into play with that. Yeah, you got to be confident with confident with what you have in there. I mean, that's a big part of it. And, and would you say, like, as far as and again, not getting into name brands, but I mean, it's probably accurate to say that the quality of the shell. You know, when you get your cheaper shells, shots not as round, or maybe doesn't have as much uh, antimony in it, um, and uh, you know, as a as a premium shell does. So obviously, a premium shell is going to perform better at a longer distance than a cheaper shell, so on and so forth. I mean, that all comes into play, right? With with every shoot. Yeah, there's a big difference. I mean, look, if you're practicing and you miss a bird because you have a cheaper shell, it doesn't matter. You know, I'll practice with cheap shells sometimes. You know, I feel like feel like I hit the birds. I just don't hit them as hard at a longer range. You know, when you're between 35 and 55 yards, there's a sh- giant difference between a uh, a cheaper load and a and a better load, in my opinion. You know, just in terms of how I watch people break birds just every day, depending on what the shells they got and they're gone. You know, I think there's a big difference once you get past 35 yards. I right. completely agree. There's a huge, there is a massive difference in 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 just energy transfer at the breaks, like just what they look like. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes, I mean, it's, I think it's worth shooting a premium load for sure. Yeah. I mean, everything that I've read and experienced up to 35 yards, you could shoot whatever, but past 35 yards, everything changes ballistically, right? Everybody's quiet. (laughs) It's just aerodynamics, you know, if the pellets, you know. The pellet's less round, it's it's not gonna go straight. Right. So you're gonna have you're gonna have less you simply like when Dave says it hits hard, it's just got more pellets on the target. That's all it is. The rest of them, you know, the rest of them are lost out in the damn field. Yeah, well, okay. and a lot of that comes with, with experience too, because as a novice shooter, you can give somebody, you know, a hundred dollar flat of shells and a fifty dollar flat of shells. And they're not going to really see the difference. But as you shoot more and as you actually read your brakes and see how the clay's breaking as you get more experience, then you realize the benefit of a more premium shell or more expensive shell because they are engineered better. And, you know, it just takes time to kind of learn that. And we're, we're finally starting to see that early on. I really wasn't a believer in like spending, you know, the extra money for a premium shell when I was in, you know, E class, D class and moving my way up through the the beginning ranks. But nowadays, you know, I can shoot just about anything like Jason said, 35 yards or under. But then of course, once you start getting out to, 40, 45, 50 and beyond, you know, it definitely makes a huge difference. And you start seeing that with your own eyes. Yeah. Anthony, in the past, you've advocated a lot for changing chokes under certain measures. Um, and you're not afraid to change chokes if need be. David, you don't even know what a choke tube is, let alone have you ever changed one in your life? <laughs> um <laughs> Starting with David, what is your basis for your thinking and why do you believe it is an advantage or disadvantage? I just always go for biggest, I, my, a huge rule in my shooting I, is just what I call biggest net benefit. Is there a benefit to choke changing? Does it positively influence the result? Yes. For me personally, 
And it's because of the way that I've structured my game, what I'm doing mentally, what I'm thinking about, what I'm paying attention to, to plan, to get ready, to execute my plan. Does the time that it takes, even though it's just barely minutes of looking at a bird, deciding my choke, going and changing it, do I have a bigger net benefit in doing that? Or do I have a bigger net benefit using that time to look for something else, to plan something else, to think about something else? For me, most of the time, and and if it's at least 51% of the time, it's it's better off for me to just spend the time doing something else. Uh, because you know, I, I can I can find a, a potential trap in a pair. I can figure out something that I, that I, where I could have gone wrong instead of thinking about just choke tubes. I'm never going to tell a student, don't get choke tubes in your gun or don't ever change. For me, there's a massive placebo effect to that as well uh, in terms of when I'm talking about my students. You know, I mean, if you feel confident changing chokes and it makes you feel good about the shot, then don't not do it because I don't do it. That's stupid. You know, I mean, the chokes there i would never argue that they're useless and i would not say that it's not worth it i just for me um it's that case and then because of the brand of gun that i shoot and and their ability to offer um a fixed choke barrel at 34 inches uh i personally like the way that that handles maneuvers and points a whole hell of a lot better than when you put choke tubes in that barrel um it totally changes the dynamics of the movement of the gun so then that's the other side of the net benefit for me. So I get a better pointable gun, better maneuverable gun, better balanced gun, and I have more time to think about other things, and I'm not worried about it. Okay. Anthony, your thoughts? I, I don't really change that much. You know, I shoot modified and modified in both barrels, and, you know, I can go a whole tournament, you know, 200 birds and, and not change. Um, but if they throw me like close, slow wind, small window, not a lot of time, you know, they throw me a bird that, you know, you look at it and go, that's kind of a shitty bullshit target. You know, <laughs> that, 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 that's the type of target that I'll change, you know, something where I don't feel like I actually have a, the opportunity that I want, you know, that's the type of target I'll change on more than anything, you know? close rabbit, you know, um, if I was going to shoot something really quick that didn't give me a good opportunity, you know, I might, I might put in a skeet choke. I really only shoot skeet choke or modified. That's basically it. So, and it's confidence, you know, so it's kind of like what David said. It's a little bit of just a placebo, you know, does skeet choke at 20 yards? Is it a lot different than modified? Yeah, it's a lot different. At 10 yards, it's probably not that different. Uh, but at 20, if you had a bird coming in that's kind of dropping out on you and you know not giving you a good shot at it, you know you, you might you might hit it with a skeet choke and and miss it with the modified. But if you know you're if you're confident you're going to hit it with your tighter choke, then leave it in there. I'm not a good choke changer, you know, so that's why I don't change a lot. You know, do I think there's probably some benefit? of changing if you can keep your mind on it and be ready when your time to shoot. Like David said, if you're worried about your chokes and not getting a plan, then it's a wash. So you, you, you haven't gained anything because you don't have a good enough plan. So I'm definitely would rather have my time for formulating my plan than changing my chokes. That's why I don't change that often. Guys like Bill McGuire though, that guy's. Yeah. It sounds like that. He's excellent at changing choke, man. I mean, he'll walk up to a stand, has a fast overhead tower that's like a high tower, like a 50-foot tower over your head. Sign up there, put in cylinder on the first barrel, okay, <laughs> and whack that son of a bitch right above his head. And his pattern's probably three times bigger than David's. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's 20 yards, 20 yards in a cylinder choke with a bird moving fast, okay, with ounce and eighth and eighths in his cylinder he's got a lot covering a lot bigger area. He can actually shoot a lot less precise than Dave can you know, on that shot. So right. he's good at it though. Okay. You know, 
So he's confident in that and he's good at it. He'll go to the next stand and put in proof cylinder and he shoots light mod most of the time, but he'll take his light mod out and put in a mod sometimes, you know? So, you know, I mean, to me, that's a lot for me to handle from a confidence standpoint, but the way he does it, you know, it works, you know, for students, you know, I keep it very simple. You know, if you have chokes in your gun, if if you don't hit 70% all the time, then you don't need any more than I see. Okay. Uh, you know, it, if, if you, if you don't hit 80% all the time, then you definitely don't need more than light mod. Uh, you know, and if you hit 90, 80 to 90, you, you can put a mod in there. You know, gotcha. uh, <laughs> if, if, if you want to change, go ahead. You know, if you, if, if you're not confident in it, keep it simple. If you're bouncing back and forth and you can't make decisions, you're probably doing the wrong thing, you know? So you got to keep it simple. You got to be confident. I do think there's an advantage for a, a less experienced shooter to have a more open choke because at the end of the day, they put the gun close to where it's supposed to be more often than they put the gun where it's supposed to be. Okay. So yeah. that's just, that's just the nature of learning the game. So they, they might hit a few more birds, you know, now, if they wanted to practice with it a little bit tighter, maybe, maybe that's a good idea. I personally am a believer for more experienced shooters. The, the, the less experienced shooter, open your choke up in competition, keep it a little tighter in practice so you can make sure you're making the right moves, et cetera. But if you're an E-class guy and you only need 72 to win a class, you don't need modified, okay, um, if the birds are an average tournament. So let's Doug Vine settle. Um, <laughs> uh, gotcha. Then you're not going to win with a 72 anyway. You're going to have a 52. Um, <laughs> gotcha. But uh, you know, keep it simple. Be be what's practical given your level. And you know, I'm a fan for experienced shooters. You know, or more experienced shooter, higher level shooters. Put in your gun what you think you're going to use in a competition. I have a lot of guys that are a master class shooter. They say, well, I normally practice with full choke. Well, what do you shoot tournaments with? Uh, light mod. Well, then yeah. how are you going to know if light mod is a good combination for the bird if you don't even practice with it? You know, right. so. No, that's true. That's true. I shoot shoot the tournament with, shoot the practice with what you're going to use. If you're more experienced, if you're less experienced, give yourself a little benefit. Gotcha. That makes sense. That definitely makes sense. All right. These next couple questions are from our coach, Bill Elliott. Um, and so I'm going to try to read this first one uh, the best I can uh, in his language. Anthony, in one of your recent videos, you speak about muzzle awareness or barrel insertion on a target and having full awareness. David, in the past, you've spoken about having zero barrel awareness. If you miss a target and you decide to give it more allowance to break the target, does this or does this not mean you have an understanding of the forward allowance in relationship to the muzzle to the to break the bird? And Anthony, let's start with you on that. And did you understand what I said there? <laughs> so I yeah, I, I guess I got the question. I'll just give you my overall theory. Okay. <laughs> so certain shots I think you definitely need to know where the gun is. Stuff you have to shoot right at, particularly stuff that's slow and you gotta be close to it. If the gun speed needs to really hook to the bird speed, like on a really slow shot, that's like a, that's like a off speed. Then I think the, you have to have a better idea of where the gun is than other targets. So that's, that's like the shots back to the eye dominance. That's the ones that people struggle with because they have to know where the gun is. And they, if they know where the gun is, now they got an eye dominance problem. Right. So the, the awareness of the gun matters more or less depending on the type of the presentation i can tell you on most shots where my gun started relative to the bird and a lot of the shots i can't but when i fire the shot i can't tell you where it was when i fired okay so if it's a maintain lead shot for me wherever I planned kind of as a rehearsal before I get into the box is where I was going to put it. So it's either, it's probably there because that's where I intended it to be. Okay. Could I tell you if it was more or less? Yeah, probably. Okay. The shots that I see the, that I know my relationship between the, 
the gun and the bird the least is like a long crosser that's stalling slow but mid speed you know that shot when i really lock my eye on the bird at the end of the shot i don't see the gun okay i could tell you that i plan to be a little bit ahead of it you know that might have looked like this but then i really let my eyes finish out that last part you know so on a shot like that i'm literally not as concerned of how much I maintained it or how much I pulled away. I'm more concerned about seeing it at the end and I won't see the arrow as clearly. Do I think muzzle awareness in a general concept is a important topic for a lot of people? Yeah. Um, and the reason is because the, I think what people forget is for people, pick up people of my level or Dave's level or anyone at our anyone at our level is we forget that when we learned we used to know where the gun was. Okay. Right. <laughs> so even though it was 20 years ago for Dave and more years ago for me, okay. We have a lot less barrel awareness now than we used to, but the definition of technique involves the barrel. So if Dave is a maintain lead shooter and I'm a pull away as a base technique, then the gun starts somewhere for both of us, you know, Dave further in front and me a little closer, but we wouldn't be able to learn that technique if we didn't have any awareness of where the gun was. So the, the prerequisite to start any technique has to have some awareness. Okay. Over time, I think the degree to which the shooter can see the gun should become less and less and less. I think the heart of the conversation right now is directly tied to the eye dominance conversation in that if we could get the person to only see the bird, eye dominance would go away. But if they're a novice shooter and they don't have control of where they put the gun, then they actually may need muzzle awareness to learn the control of where they put the gun first, but they can't, they can't have the muzzle awareness to learn the technique and eliminate eye dominance. So that's, right. that's the reason why the, that's the reason why the eye dominance is so tricky because if you think that technique is important, then eye dominance is important because if the guy told Dave, I didn't see the barrel, I only saw the bird. And he goes, well, Dave, you know, Dave goes, well, you started the gun behind the target guy. I want to just start in front of it. Okay. But you only told me to see the target, you know, well, how did the gun get behind it? Well, I didn't know because I didn't see it. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so that's the hard part. Okay. That's, that's, that's the, the barrel awareness and seeing the clay the combination of them two together is the, is the reason why shooting a shotgun is difficult. Because you have to get the, you have to be in the right spot, but you have to look at the target. <laughs> so if you're not in the right position, you're not going to hit the bird. If you're not looking at the target, you're not going to hit the bird. If you're trying to be in the right position, you're probably not looking at the target. <laughs> okay. yeah. so it all works together, the, basically. They have to go together. You have to understand the two. It's, it's, you know, it has a lot to do, in my opinion, doing them well with a soft focus versus a hard focus. If you can understand position of the barrel with a soft focus, but see the clay with a hard focus, you know, you, you, you're, you're starting to play the game a little bit better. Gotcha. All right. So David, your thoughts on this. So can you read me that question again? So I can make sure I answer it like pretty directly. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Bill says, if you missed a target and you decided to give it more allowance to break the target, does this, or does this not mean you have an understanding of the forward allowance in relationship to the muzzle to break the bird. Okay. So for me, uh, so in the assumption of what that question was based around, it's it's close, but but just a little bit off of how how I like to conceptualize lead and sight pictures and barrel awareness. So for me. I had this debate with Ben Husway on a live podcast like a while ago. And for me, I, I think if, because I hear it a lot, a lot of coaches will tell you that they, they never see the barrel. And 
I think what we need to do first is, is define what they mean by that, because if they're saying that they literally have no peripheral awareness of where the gun is in their vision on every shot that they ever take, then they're telling you that because they don't know how to teach you how to shoot. <laughs> so now I can tell, and this is actually really interesting for me for what Anthony said. So for me, barrel awareness is, um, it varies based off of the shot, uh, like what Anthony was talking about. But I'm curious, Anthony, for you, what would you say that you see the lead? The What would you say that you have the highest level? What shot would you say you have the highest level of barrel awareness on? Uh, probably an incoming. Like okay. as a general rule. Okay. Like sense. a low one and even a high one. Like on a high incomer, I don't like a stalling crow at 50 yards. I don't really, yeah. I don't really try to look at the bird. Actually. I don't, I don't necessarily try to look at the barrel, but I don't actually try to focus on the target. I just see the target. Okay. Yeah. You know, because the more I focus on the bird, the less I understand my timing of my gun and I can make a good, I can see the bird crystal clear and miss the target. Yeah. You know, even, even if I feel like everything's in sync, et cetera, you know, so it's not that I look at the gun, but I, I don't try not to see it, you know? Right. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. yeah. I'm the same way it, on a crow like that, especially with how high my eye is over the rib. I mean, I actually almost try to force a little bit of barrel awareness on purpose uh, so that I can make sure that on that type of shot that everything is right. If yeah, I have no low, barrel awareness on that shot, I probably am going to miss. A low incomer, like low to the ground, I see the barrel a lot. You know, that that's yeah. the one for me that I force the barrel awareness. Like I have How about on it. a what do you see on a quartering bird? Let's say like the trap is right next to you. If I you know, like a no lead shot. Yeah. So like on that shot as long as I don't start ahead of it, I can just look at the bird. I can see the bird crystal clear. So when okay. you're doing a swing, so you, you would approach that shot. To yeah, a swing through. through to me is, you know, the gun comes to the bird from not, you know, not swing through, you know, abruptly, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen you do that before. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I just come up and touch it from the back slightly behind it, I can see the bird. I can see the bird clear on that. You know, I can look at it crystal clear. You know, if I'm ahead of it, I would probably have to see the gun more for a moment. Okay. Before I looked at it mm -hmm. to actually make sure that I got the gun and the bird connected. If I come from behind it, I feel like I can just look at it. If the bird takes no lead, if the bird takes a lot of lead, or some lead even, I'm, I'm not generally too far behind it. Okay. Okay, yeah. let, me, let me throw this in there, Dave. Hold on a minute. You're talking about a quartering yeah. bird, right? Close quartering bird. Yeah. Th th this is one for you that you guys are going to think either I'm a nutcase or I'm an idiot or both. Um, I got to vote on that. Shut up, Sean. <laughs> so, okay. Right to left quartering bird. I'm a right-handed yeah. shooter. Right hand, right eye dominant. Mm -hmm. I will hold my barrel almost within an inch of the break point, and I'll let that bird come right down my rail and squeeze the trigger with, like, very little barrel movement, okay? If it's a left to right quartering, the same distance, I'm almost inserting the gun halfway from the break point to the, to the thrower, and I'm moving the barrel with the bird. Now explain that. Because I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. So you tell me why am I doing that? Or or I mean, I'm still breaking the target, but do you understand where I'm going with this? Yeah. Uh, I mean, unless it's any physical reason why that's happening, my guess would just be that it's because uh, it has to do with how much of the barrel you see doing it each way. If you're looking, I mean, it's just my guess. I'd have to watch you shooting it. Because sometimes, a lot of times, our perception of what's happening isn't exactly really what's happening. But I, I would say maybe, depending on what mechanic that you shoot on a quartering bird. So, like, for me, the way that you explain shooting 
a right to left quartering bird is almost exactly how I shoot quartering birds, period. So I basically shoot that in a massive collapsing lead. And the reason why I do that is because it, it to me, this is why I asked Anthony that about a quartering bird. Uh, because I happen to probably see more barrel on a crossing bird than I do. Like for me, a quartering bird is about the only target where I have zero. I actually exactly have zero barrel awareness for the shot. It's the only shot that I can say that I'm completely unaware of where the barrel is, but it's because of the mechanic that I shoot. And it's because of how much two dimensional space in front of me is is in between where my gun is starting, where my eyes are starting, and where the target is coming from. Okay, so um, I'm really anxious to hear both of your opinions. Now, let me let me twist this a little bit. When it's okay. a right to left quartering, I'm watching it come right down the rail. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Wait, right down the what? Say that again. Right down the rail. Okay. You're looking okay. at the trap, or where are you looking at? I'm I'm looking at the target, probably. 10 feet out of the trap and I'm starting to get a hard focus. I don't have a mid bead, but basically where the mid bead would be, I'm starting to get a hard focus. Okay. And then right as it's coming to the tip of my barrel, I'm squeezing the trigger and I'm watching it just disintegrate. If it's a left to right, I have zero barrel awareness and I'm, I'm moving the gun with the target. Whereas a right to left, there's very little gun movement. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. So I'm right to left. I'm watching it come right down the rail. You're, the wa you're waiting on it. Yeah, I'm waiting on it. Yeah. And, and if it's a left to right, now all of a sudden I'm moving the gun with it. Well, okay. that's just simply because both your eyes are on the left side of the gun. Oh, wow. Okay. So see, I made myself <laughs> out to be an idiot. So <laughs> thanks, Dave. I had you on here to make me look good. You just totally <laughs> squashed that. So. Uh. Boy. Anthony, do you have Does that make sense though? Does yes. that make sense to you? Yeah. Yes. You're going to have a higher level of awareness of, of the gun, especially if you're starting close to mounted or pre mounted or, or like a cheap mount on that type of shot. Uh, you know, both eyes are on the left side of the gun. So you got to look over the gun to see the bird. Okay. If, you're, if you're shooting a left to right quartering bird and you're right handed, when you look to the left for the bird, the gun is on the right side of your eyes. Okay. Whereas if you're shooting a right to left bird, quartering and you look to the right to the bird the gun is in between your eyes and the bird gotcha anthony any rebuttal on that or are you of the same opinion M no i mean my guess is where is, is the trap like to the side of you or in front of you a little bit uh to the side of me both but yeah. either the right side or the left side of me my guess is if you want to make it the same which probably would make sense if you got the same target you should probably do the same thing you're probably looking in the wrong spot and it 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 works better and the way you see the bird when the bird comes out of the trap is you know potentially wrong potentially wrong both ways and you just figured out how to shoot it from either <laughs> side okay. you, jason you should try on the right to left to put your chin on the right side of the stock what Say that again. Wait, 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 wait. You just confused I'm me. Say this again. <laughs> Is this more of your... Uh, Here we you, go. What do you call that? Your collapse? No, what What was that technique? This is, that would be your... Uh, right now, I'm giving you lesson two of lead reduction. <laughs> lead reduction? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're, let's get back on track. Um, all right. So, Bill's got another good one here. Um, he says, Anthony, when I watched you a month ago... You're in the gun 100% hard. David, you are barely in the gun, and I'm going to interject here. I, I, you shoot from the belly button. Um, <laughs> Anthony, you have advocated proper gun fit. David, you, David, we have seen students of yours who are center ocular and have the gun 45 degree canted in the middle of their nose. <laughs> Both of you have what? different view. This is his question. This is Bill. This is Bill. Both of you have different viewpoints on gun fit. So for each of you, what is the rationale on gun fit as it relates to eye dominance? And he says, we will start with you, David. Well, gun fit for eye dominance is 
let's say that whatever handedness you are, whatever side of the sh- shooting that you're going to be shooting on, if you're if your cyclopean position is anywhere on that half of your face, so if you're right-handed and it's anywhere between your nose and your right eye, then I want it, honestly, it's impossible to answer that question perfectly because it's really going to depend on the person. Uh, but it's going to vary anywhere from directly under the right eye with a little bit of vertical separation so as to eliminate barrel awareness. That's also not going to work if you shoot pre-mounted because you're going to have barrel awareness and you're going to shoot over everything. If you shoot the way that I teach, which is more proprioceptively, you're coming in with the gun the latest moment possible, uh, then you can have your eye higher over the rib because barrel awareness is is minimal but general rule of thumb is if i have someone with hand, uh, eye dominance issue i'm gonna number one i'm gonna try not changing the horizontal placement of their eye over the rib so keeping it underneath the 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 corresponding eye to handedness of the shooter but just play with the vertical separation of the eye so basically making the gun lower um if that doesn't work then i'm going to try to position the gun inside of it like on the cyclopean position so for example if i have a a student who is you're not going to understand like the r2 l2 thing but basically let's say if somebody comes up to their cyclopean position is like in between their right eye and their nose then I want to try to get the gun to come in between. I want the, If I were to look down the barrel, I would want to kind of try to see that barrel in the same place the cyclopean position tests in because that's where the brain filters those two images into one. If I, if then, so that's the second thing I'm going to try. If that doesn't work, then there's a couple other things I can do, but they're way more complex. But in terms of fit goes... Uh, for an eye dominant specific issue, if I were to, t- I mean, if I were to tell you that there's one answer to everything, I'm I'm lying to you. It really has to be an experimentation until we find what works really good. And unless Anthony has another example that that would say that I'm wrong, but in every in every example that I've gotten of this in lessons, there's not a fix all solution. One thing that tends to work is creating vertical separation of the eye over the rib without influencing horizontal placement of the eye and teaching the student to work visual control really hard. Now that's going to, it's going to fluctuate depending on their, their ability to handle pressure situations and their ability to really focus on visual control and the visual mechanics of shooting, learning hard focus and soft focus, being self-aware with how long that takes for them. Because if they're doing it, if they're hitting hard focus too early, you're going to have barrel awareness before the shot's taken, which is going to lead to, if I, if I don't have vertical separation, um, it's going to lead to a miss left or right based off the eye dominance. If I do have vertical separation to try to, to try to, uh, put a bandaid over the eye dominance issue and they hit a uh, hard focus too early in the shot in their visual mechanics, then it's going to end up with them missing probably both over and left or right. So that's not an answer I can give you with, with, with one quick solution. Basically the answer is go to a guy that knows what he's doing and he's going to have to find out with you specifically. Right. You know, the way that Anthony teaches you to shoot is, is different in relation to the way that I'll teach you to shoot mechanics. He's going to like, I'm in the gun a lot less than Anthony, not that it's better or worse. It's just, that's what it is. If I'm like the thing that I would have to teach you to do to negate the eye dominance might be a little bit different than what Anthony would have to teach you to do to negate the eye dominance because we're both trying to teach you our different styles. Right, right. Anthony, what do you think? If the person is off slightly dominant, okay, and you're assuming you're going to shoot, you know, if the person is shooting with one eye or with a dot, then you put the gun under their eye and you make it fit, you know, and shoot 60, traditionally, yeah. it's traditionally it's, it, there's, there's no, there's no compensation for the fit. If you put the gun, 
put your head on the gun and get your eye in line with a gun and have the gun that shoots traditionally call it 60, 40. And it works. I think that's your, I think that makes the most sense geometrically. Okay. You know, your eye is in the same position relative to the barrel. There's, there's no, uh, there's no variance, you know, it's not going to move left or right because it's up too high. It's not going to be higher or lower. It's going to be in the same spot at every time. So if that doesn't work, you know, and it's not working, the person's missing, you can see a little bit of that on a pattering board, but I'm, I don't think the pattering board tells us as much as a lot of people think it does because the board's not moving. You can have some cast that puts the barrel slightly out of position with the eye to get to like where Dave's saying, where your vision's actually really originating from, which is not dead under your right eye. It might be somewhere between your right eye and your nose if you've got some form of a degree of dominance. But that doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that your vision originates like in that exact spot all the time. Because if the person hits everything, you know, except a few certain shots that give them a problem, then if you move the gun over, what about all the birds that they were crushing before when it was under the right eye? You know? right. So, you know, there, there, there's no, to Dave's point, there's no simple answer to this. If you're looking at the bird, if you're trusting your eyes, a lot of that stuff goes away. The problem is if, you know, uh, which, which is the hard part. The, there's no, there's no single answer. If I had to give you a generalization of what I would say, when I have someone that has eye dominance and they're shooting with two eyes and they're doing well, I generally don't worry that much about where their head position is. Okay. Yeah. If they're, if they're not shooting well and their head's all over the place, I'll generally bring it back to center. Like, let's get right under your eye, get the eye in line with a gun, and see if your brain can see if your brain can learn what it looks like. So, when you go with the idea that we're just going to let it be where it is and we're going to trust our eyes, that's the you make the assumption that the perception is accurate. But if the perception is not accurate. I'd rather just put the gun in line with the eye and see if the person can perceive, you know, the brain can learn to perceive what it is. So they might not realize it, but they might automatically then give some of the left shots a little more than some of the right shots or vice versa, you know. And as long as their brain can figure that out, maybe a consistent baseline where they're in the same spot all the time, while the way they have to shoot the bird might be slightly different, they got the same thing every time, you know, it's the same every time. So there's no good answer. That's, that's the best I can give you. I, I'd rather be in line with the gun with my eye than not. But if the person's off dominant and they're out of line, you know, we're going to roll with it. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. Gotcha. Well, guys, we're down to the last question of the evening and I, I can't say anything, but thank you so much for sticking in here. I know it's late and I know we're, uh, we're trying to wrap it up. You guys got things to do tomorrow. So <clears throat> last question, uh, training and practice are two different animals. How do you recommend to your students? How do you recommend they train for competition? We start with Anthony. Yeah. I'll start with Anthony. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that I always tell people is you, you, you want to, we, we, first you can just talk about, you know, the question is, you know, let's start with just how often, you know? So, um, what I always tell people is what's practical. Okay. So if you can get out and shoot a hundred rounds a week, great. If you can do 500, great. You're probably going to get better five times faster. You know, it's just, just the reality, just like, just like any sport. So I think that's a important variable, but it's also the person is going to improve regardless of the amount. It's just a matter of how fast they're stepping on the accelerator. Okay. So I think that's important. And the, I think a lot of people listen to these podcasts and they say, you know, you know, you hear, you know, people say, well, when I was practicing a lot, I would, empty the whole trap out and then fill it up and empty it out again. Well, most people can't do that, unfortunately. Okay. Um, for, for a multitude of reasons. That's a lot, right? of, that's a lot so, of shooting. 
the least. If you are going to do that, that, you should come to my place and do it, and I'll charge you forty-five cents to target. <laughs> right. <laughs> the least of which is, you know, cost ammo, yeah. and, ammo and shells. Okay. Right. You know, ammo sh- and targets rather. So that's not always practical for a lot of people. So do what you can. Okay. You do whatever's practical. You know, I, I don't want ever want to discourage someone by telling them what I need them to do. And they say, well, I can't do that. Okay. So <laughs> do what's practical. Work on the techniques that we've given you. You want to be more conscious in practice, in my opinion, than most people are. So I'm pretty conscious in my practice about what I'm doing and how precisely I'm doing it. And if I did a good job, kind of back to like your post shot. When I'm in a tournament, I don't really care how I hit it. When I'm in practice, I want to be very precise with how I hit the bird because then I can do that over and over. And that's what builds skill to builds my skill set to repeat that same process over and over. Okay. So if I know exactly what I did and I can break down the parts of the shot, then I can do that 20 times in a row. When I do that 20 times in a row, I'm now more skilled. So now I can do that in competition with less conscious thought and do that, you know, with while trusting my hands and my eyes and, and be shooting as much towards subconscious as I'm going to get that day. So practice your weaknesses train consciously train techniques that you think you're working on to improve your skill set uh don't worry about shooting lots of different types of targets work on mastering the targets what i always say i say practice in order of difficulty so you you only add difficulty when the targets that are of less difficulty you can hit every time so if you can't get past 35 yards then just practice up to 35 yards in the next tournament, you'll hit all birds inside 35 yards. Okay. And if you do that in most tournaments, you, you'll, you won't, you'll rarely shoot below your expectations. So, um, I do that to this day. There's big tournaments that I'll go to and I literally will never practice a bird over 40 yards if I hadn't gotten to those yet. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> if I can hit all the birds inside 40 yards, and I go to the national championship, I would be the national champion every goddamn year. Okay. (laughs) You you probably shoot a 300 every year. So the reality is, you know, that tells us a lot though. Okay. Because the, there's enough sequences of pairs and doubles and fast and speed, et cetera, but 40 yards and in that the, they, that is more than missable, you know? So, Practice in order, practice in order of difficulty, practice consciously, practice with repetition and, you know, worry about how you did it and master it. You know, then when you get to the competition, just shoot them. Gotcha. David, uh, any thoughts you want to add to that? I mean, I think that there's, uh, I mean, I I wouldn't disagree with anything Anthony said. Um, The... The thing that I think you got to work work on, and the thing that Anthony said that really hits home for me, if I'm looking through the lens of so many people trying to get better, is that in reality, people don't know how to practice. And they think that practicing is just going to shoot, and they're not self-aware while they're shooting. Um, you know, like, man, if I if I knew now, if I knew back when I started, what I know now about practicing, I could have gotten better and cost my dad about $50,000 less <laughs> uh, to get to the same level. Um, because so many people, when they're first starting, they think that practice is just shooting and shooting and shooting, and they just go on autopilot and they just go through the course and they shoot. And volume is an important component of practice it is you have to have targets under your belt to build an inventory um for so many reasons so volume is important it's not something to be discredited or taken out of your practice but one thing that's hugely important is is like the word anthony used was conscious the word i use is self-aware like shooting is a physical movement if you want to get good at shooting, you need to master the physical movement of your body. And that sounds kind of maybe dumb to say, but if you think about 
Like, have you ever watched? I mean, I, this is just a random example that's popping into my head because I saw it like a couple of hours ago. Some guy building our lodge up here was showing me a video on his phone of this magician. All right. And you watch him play with the cards in his hands. And it's like, holy cow, he just moves his hands differently than me because he's done that so often. The physical movement of dexterity in his fingers is so precise and and practice that he can do things that I can't. And so, but you don't do that by just holding cards in your hands all day you and moving them around. You have to be consciously aware of how you're moving them, what you're doing, and and be thinking about what it feels like, what you want it to feel like as you're doing it. It's the same thing with when you're shooting, when you're trying to practice and train. You have to be physically self-aware of what you're doing. You have to be consciously self-aware of what you're thinking. And you have to be visually self-aware about what you're seeing. And if you can do those things when you're when you're practicing, you'll you'll kind of like jumpstart a lot of just volume shooters. Um, but then on top of that, you can't forget the quantity aspect of training. Um, and then on top of that, I think it's also really important to train the routines that you do. If you're trying to get better at competing, you know, you need if, if in a match, you know, you I have for my regular students that come to my place that come to Cypress Creek a lot. Um, I mean, I, I have a, a, a couple of different people that are like weekly lessons, sometimes bi-weekly lessons, like maybe once every four lessons, I throw them a tournament and I, at our squad, I, I schedule them all together at the same time. We got six people coming out and we all go through a scored tournament. I have scorecards. I, I mean, it's official. I want them to train the routines that they do when they're, when they're practicing. When I was trying to learn to get better, I would do that too. I would call up guys at the club. I'd ask the club if I could go, you know, set a feet test parkour or something. And I would practice tournaments, practice competing. You know, that's, um, that's funny you say that Dave, because Bill will start off the lesson with 50 birds for score. So yeah. it, it, it's putting you in that mental state of a tournament. You know, hey, I'm shooting for score. And all of a sudden, what's going to go be a fun lesson all just became a pressure situation. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. And it, it's funny because when I go out to train and not practice, and, and again, I'm speaking complete ignorance here compared to you two. When I go out to train versus practice, I go out with the, with the intent of the first 50 birds or for score. And it's like, holy cow, if I would have been in a tournament, I'd have been in trouble right here. And yeah. it, it's funny because in pra I always said I am a practice class champion. <laughs> like when I go out with my buddies and we're practicing, I can shoot with the master's class, no problem. But I come to a tournament situation and all of a sudden it's like, how are you in A class? So to apply that pressure to a training session, I think is extremely valid. Would you not agree? Yeah, I'd agree, but I'd also say it's sometimes really hard to do. It's extremely hard to simulate match pressure in a tournament. I one of the best things that I ever used to do, and it was it I think it's really good because you know, you can bet your friends money and stuff, but that's you know, sometimes, you know, who really cares? But I used to do these things called go home rounds where I'd, I'd, you know, I mean, it's not easy if, if unless you live at a, a club to go practice, you know, uh, pretty much everybody's got to get, you know, plan the day, pack up, drive out. Some people got to drive over an hour to go practice. Right. Um, you know, both Anthony and I were extremely fortunate that that, that was not the case for either of us. Um, but, uh, but that is the case for most people, but I would do practice where, you know, I just to, to simulate pressure, I wouldn't allow my, so I, I go practice, but I had to shoot a 25 straight before I would practice. If I missed one in a 25 straight and ski, you know, like if I, even if I shot a 24, the second I missed my first bird, I pack up everything. And I go home. So I, I could serious? go. Yeah. Dead serious. Wow. And that, and, um, you know, I started to do that before I could drive and that's when my dad, you know, my dad would have to, so it'd be a big deal, you know, to, to miss one because then my dad would be like seriously you know <laughs> but uh, 
but that I mean, just do anything you can to simulate pressure. And that, but I'm not saying do that all the time. You got to exactly what Anthony said. You got to practice all those things. You ha- you have to have purpose in what you're doing. Awesome. Well, listen, both of you, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Anthony, thank you. David, thank you both from the bottom of our heart. Yeah, um, definitely. We really appreciate this. Um, I this has been. Probably the most informative podcast I know I have ever heard. Um, no, no discredit to David. <laughs> it was, it was, it was even informative to me. I'm going to call Dave when the podcast is over and ask him what half the words are. He's got his Ranger. You can't hit what you can't see. With 14 clay sight lenses manufactured by Carl Zeiss Vision, Ranger lenses add target clarity and contrast no matter the lighting condition. Visit reranger.com for all your shooting eyewear needs. Free shipping and returns in the U.S. on orders of $90 or more. And if you use the code DEADPAIR at checkout, you will save 10% off your order. See it further. See it faster. See it with precision with RE Ranger. You know, Sean, <laughs> arguably two of the greatest coaches in the United States. Without- just Without a doubt. Yeah, we just had him on the show here for somewhat of a debate. I thought it would be more of a debate, but they ended up being a lot of, uh, how do I want to say this? Uh, They coincided with each other a lot on their thoughts, just different different ways of voicing their viewpoints. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's pretty indicative of shooting. I mean, we, we, you and I shoot similarly in some ways, but in other ways we have differences. Yeah. So I think that's that's very valid. You yeah. Know? So it was I mean I hope I hope our listeners got a lot out of this because it, it, if it's a new guy or even if it's a master class shooter there's information here that's going to help everybody and to really dive deep into some of these subjects both Anthony and David just really hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I mean you're talking about guys that, you know, unparalleled levels of experience and being coaches they're they're out there every day trying to teach shooters of all walks of life all levels of experience that's right and you know for some of you guys that are just getting into this uh, some of these topics may be a little over your head at this point but i think that even if you're an advanced or intermediate shooter shooter there's going to be things that you can pick up on take home learn right uh, and grow from right for sure so thank you anthony and david appreciate you joining us um I hope everyone will keep this one in the memory bank. Um, you know, obviously they're always going to be available on our website and on, you know, your favorite podcast outlet. You can always reference it. This is kind of like a uh, library, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we've got all our episodes posted on our website, you know, visit the Uh You can download a lot, all of our episodes there as well as your favorite uh, podcast uh, outlets, such as Apple podcast, Google podcast, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. I mean, we can go down the list. There's a bunch of them. Right. And thank you to Game Boar, Negrini, RE Ranger, Atlas Traps, and Bear Pelt. All of this was brought to you by them. So please visit their websites, follow them, like them on social media. Um, <laughs> their products are unbelievable. Yeah. And we've got way more stuff coming, guys. We've got almost a month and a half already planned out ahead for this season. Uh, so, you know, stay- some, some of which is already recorded. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, keep coming back. We're going to try to keep putting things uh, on here that you guys want to hear. Keep sending us those questions for the coaches. Keep sending us ideas or suggestions for future shows. Uh, there's just a lot coming up. Yeah. Speaking of which, um, the next episode will feature Kevin DeMichael for questions for the coaches. So please send those questions in. We'll get them answered. Um, I think following that is Don Grant, I believe. Yeah, well, I'll definitely get her on here and talk a little bit about her mental training because that's so important to our game. Yeah, for sure. So don't hesitate. Email us. Hit us up on social media. Send us questions in. Don't forget about us when you, when you know you have that nagging question. You're out on the course, and it's like, how do I – how do you even begin to fathom this this target, right? Yeah, we're, we're here to help you guys. And again, uh, we say it every time. We built this podcast for you. We built these podcasts to bring more shooters into the sport. Uh, and we hope that you tune back in for the next episode of The Dead Pair. That's right. And we'll see you next week on The Dead Pair. <laughs>